we're in a series we're calling Even Though, just taking a couple, look at a couple of different times in Scripture where the Bible uses the words even though and trying to answer some of the perplexing questions that we have about life and faith. Let me start by asking you a question this morning. Uh, would you consider yourself a blessed person? Would you consider yourself a blessed person? According to Ephesians 1.3, if you have a relationship with Jesus, then you are blessed. It's a promise. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So if we have a relationship with Jesus, then we are promised to live a blessed life. It's not something that the TV evangelist just says. It's something that we are promised to live a blessed life. The problem for me, at least, and I would imagine the problem for you, is that sometimes I don't feel blessed. Sometimes I don't feel like God is necessarily keeping his promise to bless me. Sometimes I look with human eyes and I don't have what I want or I don't have what they have and I don't feel blessed. And you see, what that is, is it's obviously not God failing to keep his promise. What it is, it's me having a bad perspective of my, my blessing. It's kind of like this banana. This banana, you can, you can see it, right? We could make banana nut bread. We could make banana split. We could make, I'm trying to think of more banana recipes, but that's all I got. But banana pudding. I missed that one. We're in the South. Y'all going to kick me out. Y'all t- I take back my applause about that preacher thing. That's where I'm headed. But you can make a lot of different things out of this banana. Now, I can see this banana, right? Y'all see it? Y'all seen a banana before? I can, I can peel this banana. Whether you like bananas or not, you have to admit that this is a banana. I have a clear view of this banana. But let's say that I decide to, to make a smoothie. And so I take my banana. I break it in half. Y'all didn't know y'all were getting a cooking class this morning. Put that in the blender. Let's take a couple of blueberries. Put that in there too. Y'all like blueberries? You like blueberries? <laughs> you caught it. Good catch. We'll take a cup of blueberries. We'll dump that in there. We've lost you for the day. He can't throw it back. I would just like to say, if y'all do not like my message, please don't throw stuff, okay? <laughs> she is a bad example. But as I, as, I, as I begin to make my smoothie, and I take some, let's take some strawberries. We'll dump those in there. We'll take a little, a little milk. We'll dump that in there. And then, let's say that I turn this sucker on. For about three minutes or so. No, I'm just kidding. Well, where, where's my banana? My, it's in there, but it's been blended with, with other stuff. And so now the banana that we could see so clearly earlier, when it's blended with the other stuff, all of a sudden it seems to disappear. You know, sometimes I think our blessings get lost in the blender of life. It's not that we don't live blessed lives. It's that our lives, as we live them, get blended up through problems that we have. It's not that we're not blessed. It's that sometimes I still feel alone, even though there's a lot of people in the room. It's not that... It's not that I'm not not blessed. It's just that sometimes finances don't go my way and I still find myself in want. It's not that I'm not blessed. It's just that it gets blended into uh, the struggle I have with my spouse or the struggle I have with my kids. The the blessings are are still there. The problem is is that life begins to to, to blend in and we begin to, to lose sight of the blessings that God has for us. Sometimes it's hard for us to look at our lives And trust the promise of Ephesians 1, 3, that God will bless us because it gets blended with the up and down, the struggle of life, and we lose sight that at the end of the day, we are blessed people today. Yeah, come on. 
Y'all are on it today. This is going to be awesome. Today, I want to talk from the subject of blended blessings. Blended blessings. And if I had a subtitle today, it would be when life seems un. Fair. And it's important that we, that we understand how, that we live blessed lives because it really does frame our view of who we really believe that God is. It's important that we're grateful people because it, it changes our view of God and how he interacts with us and how he loves us and how he takes care of us. It, it's important that we're grateful because even beyond the spiritual element, there's some psychological things that come with being grateful. As a matter of fact, psychology today said that gratitude improves physical health, improves psychological health, enhances empathy, reduces aggression, gratefulness improves sleep. How many want that? Gratefulness, being grateful, improves self-esteem. It increases mental strength. And the most important reason of all is that gratefulness strengthens our faith. And when we become grateful people, we begin to see God for who he really is. When we become grateful people, we begin to believe and truly begin to understand that God does love us, that he does have good things for us, that he does care about us, and that he hasn't left us even though it's blended in everyday life. Today, I'm going to be in Joshua 17. Just to kind of set this passage up, last week um, I talked about Moses and the Israelites and the promise of the promised land and being released from Egypt. Today, I want to advance that story a little bit. Joshua 17, at this point, the Israelites, God's chosen people, have busted out of slavery in Egypt. At this point in the Israelites' story, they are actually in Canaan, which was the promised land. It was the promised land that God had promised them of abundance and freedom and great things. They were in that promised land, but they still saw, when they got to Canaan, they still saw Canaanites in the land. So their job was to drive out the Canaanites, to battle the Canaanites so that they could fully inherit the land. And so God gives Joshua, who is leading the Israelites at this point, a plan. He says, I want you to divide the land that you're about to, to, to overtake. I want you to divide it into the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes of Israel are 12 sections of the nation. They were named um, after the descendants of Jacob, he says, I want you to divide the land among these 12 tribes, and the land that you give them, they will go in and they will take that specific part of the land, and that's how you are going to get to your promised land. And so that's where we, we pick up the story. There's two tribes in Joshua 17 that have not been satisfied by their allotment of land, and this is what they say. It says, the descendants of Joseph came to Joshua and asked, Why have you given us only one portion of land as our homeland when the Lord has blessed us with so many people? So these tribes have been blessed. They even say it in that passage. They say, we've been blessed with a lot of people. They admit that there are some things that we've been blessed with. And you have to understand and take into context that in this time period, being blessed was having large amounts of people, having offspring, having land. That, those were seen as material blessings, having livestock, having animals. Those were material blessings. As a matter of fact, when you read the term blessed, when we're talking about person being blessed in the Old Testament, it literally means to make happy usually with physical means, with stuff that people can touch and can see. And so the Israelites, they say, we've been blessed. We've been blessed with a lot of people. We've been blessed with the things that we want to be blessed with. We've been blessed with material things. That is how they are defining their blessing. Not much has changed, has it? Because when I asked that question earlier, would you consider yourself blessed? Most of you, no matter how spiritual you are, you went to a point of beginning to make a checklist of the things that you have and do not have. We still define blessing like this today. As a matter of fact, never before, I believe, have we defined blessing as the stuff that I have and the stuff that I get. We can see what everybody else has on Facebook or Instagram. We can see what everybody, the pictures everybody takes. And so we define blessing so often as what I have and what my physical, what I see physically right in front of me. That's what they're doing. They're saying we've been blessed 
We can, we can see that. We, we can see the blessings. And you've been there. You've been able to see your blessings, haven't you? Those are the things that you've prayed for. You've prayed for the new job. You've prayed for the car. You've prayed for the house. You've prayed for the gadget. You've prayed for the thing. And so often we define that as blessing. But what happens two weeks later? The joy from the blessing begins to wear off, doesn't it? When it gets blended into everyday life, all of, the, all of the sudden, the, the joy from the physical things, from the material things, it begins to, it begins to wane. And so what do you what do? You, do? You, need that, you, need, you need another blessing. You need something else. You need, you need more. You need more money. You need a, a, a bigger house. You need something, something more because the joy found in the blessing gets blended into regular life and you begin to lose it. That's where these tribes are. They've been blessed. But the joy has has gone away. They don't feel blessed. And now it seems like they have another problem. He says, they say, you've blessed us. We've been blessed with a lot of people, but now we need more land. Have you, have you ever had what you thought was a blessing turn into what felt like a curse? Like, you prayed for that job. You text everybody you knew that you thought had ever prayed a prayer in their life to pray for you when you had that interview Monday morning at 11 o'clock. You begged God for it. You got down on your knees. You fasted, and you don't even know what fasting means, but you did it fast. <laughs> God gave you the job. You've been working there two years. You know your coworkers. You know your boss, and you're getting tired of it, right? Or what about that car? Ah, you wanted that. The one you had was duct taped together. You had to beat on the starter to get it to work. You wanted that car, but then you drove it off the lot. You stretched yourself too far, and now you would like something. You would like to be able to pay for something rather than a car payment. What about those kids? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Y'all thought I was going to go there. <laughs> but have you ever prayed for something, and in the moment it, it was a blessing, but later it felt, it, it, it felt like a curse? Doesn't that tell you about how we view blessing? Doesn't that kind of describe the faultiness of our definition of blessing? As long as we frame blessing as something that makes me feel good, we'll forget that we're blessed people. Because you forgot about that blessing that you begged God for when you got that job, when it became difficult. And as long as we continuously think, I'm only blessed when I feel good and based off of material things, we will continue to think we're not blessed. And this is key because some of you think that God's not blessing you, when in reality, your definition of blessing is just screwed up. God still loves you. He's still chasing after you. God still keeps his promises. Ephesians 1, 3, that he's going to bless you with every spiritual blessing is true for you. And if you forget that, you will lose sight of who God really is. You've got to redefine blessing because it gets, it gets, it gets blended. So the Israelites have had what appeared to be a blessing turn into a curse because now they have a lot of people. And they're coming to Joshua and they're saying, hey, we need some wiggle room. We need some more room. They say, we have a lot of people, but Joshua, you've only given us one portion of land. In other words, they're saying, we got this blessing, but we need another one. Do you ever get so focused on what you want that you lose sight of what you have? Do you ever get so focused... And I know that, that sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a survival thing for you because you have to have something to look forward to. You have to have something to push for. But sometimes it is entirely possible for us to lose sight of everything we have because of what we hope for in the future. Some of you are working so hard, you have missed your family for three years now because you are chasing blessings ten years from now. And you are literally standing in the blessings of God but you can't see them because you're so busy pursuing what you want in the future. Some of us today, myself included, we are literally wallowing in the blessings of God, but we've lost sight of them. Every person that walked through these doors today, you took breath into your lungs. That's a blessing. 
Every person that walked into the door this morning, you have a heartbeat. That's a blessing. Most of this mor- us this morning drove our car, parked it in the parking lot. No matter how nervous we were, it wasn't going to make it here. We still drove a car. That is a blessing. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you have literally been wiped clean from all of the disgusting sin of your past. His grace is a blessing. If you have... If you have people that you can literally say, I love you, that is a blessing. You belong to the most amazing church in the world. That is a blessing. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight. And this is why it matters. Don't lose sight of your blessing. Chasing what you want for tomorrow because you'll lose sight of the greatness of God in your life. They say, we've been blessed. We've been blessed. Can we get, can we get another blessing? We, we've been blessed. Let, 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 let's ignore that. Let's ignore that because, because, because now we need, we need something else. We need more land. And isn't that how sick we are in today's culture? That we need another hit of that. We need an, another hit of that just so that we can feel blessed. Just so we can feel loved. So Joshua He responds to these tribes in verse 15. He says, if there are so many of you, and if the hill country of Ephraim is not large enough for you, clear out the land for yourselves in the forest where the Perizzites and Raphites live. The Raphites were known to be giants. They were known to be very, very large creatures. So understand where these tribes find themselves. They're in the promised land. They're where God told them they would be. But yet there were still parts of the land that they had to conquer. There were still parts of their section of land that they still had to fight some enemies. They were promised this land, but they still had to drive out some of the Canaanites living there. I think sometimes our blessings get blended because we want them served as finished products. Sometimes God's blessing is an open door. What God is telling these Israelites, what Joshua is trying to tell this tribe is he's saying, the blessing is yours. You have been blessed with a lot of people. God has promised to give you this land. Now you've got to do something to go get it. And some of us, especially in today's culture, and I don't want to sound like an old man, I don't want to sound like somebody who's saying, get off my lawn. But in today's culture, we don't want to work for our blessings. But sometimes our blessings get blended in our own responsibility. Some of us are, are, are waiting for a new job, but we're not being faithful in the job we already have. Some of us are asking God for a job. and We haven't even gone to Indeed.com. Some of us are asking God for, 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 for more money when what he really wants you to do is he wants to talk to you, for you to talk to somebody about making a budget. And he wants you to start tithing first. Sometimes we lose sight of the blessing of God and God is holding his hands out, asking us to take the blessing that he has for us, but we don't reach for it and do our part. So these tribes are going to have to They're going to have to work a little bit. And what we would do, what a lot of people in our culture today, they would go back to Joshua and say, well, everybody else has enough land. And Joshua would look at them and say, so do you if you'll work for it. It, Everybody else is blessed the way it is is blessed and Joshua would look at them and say you're blessed too God's not the problem the problem is is they're blended because we have to do we have to do our part they have to go they have to go take this land sometimes God's blessing is blended because they're not finished products they're just potential for for blessing so maybe he is blessing you maybe he wants to bless you what move do you need to make to go get it? Obviously, 
the tribe of Joseph didn't love Joshua's response. So they speak up in verse 16. It says, the descendants of Joseph responded. It's true that the hill country is not large enough for us. But, it's a big but. But all the Canaanites in the lowlands have iron chariots. Both those in Bethshan and its surrounding settlements and those in the valley of Jezreel. They are too strong for us. Let me just take this little moment here to tell you not to compare your blessings to other people. Never before has it been easier for me to compare what other people have, the people other people have, the way people look, the vacations they take, the things they do for fun. Never before has it been easier for me to compare my blessings with somebody else. Can I just tell you God's blessing bucket is big enough for them to get theirs and for you to get yours? And, that, and, that, and that's another thing is don't judge other people for what they have. Because some of us do that, right? You see what they have, and you're thinking the whole time, I know they've got to be up to their knees in debt. They, <laughs> and it, it almost causes something inside of you, doesn't it? Because it's almost like we think that if, if they're blessed, God's not big enough to bless us too. God's blessing bucket is big enough for you and for them. Don't compare your blessings to other people because what you'll do is you'll begin to say, God, you're better to them than you are to me. When, when God never promised to treat all of his children the same. What good parent does that? And also, on the, on the other hand, kind of like what, what they're about to face here, sometimes bigger blessings mean bigger responsibilities. They've been blessed with a lot of people, but now they have a bigger responsibility because they've got to drive out more Canaanites. The people that you look at, the people that I look at sometimes, and I think, oh, they have it all. They've been so blessed. We don't know the pressure they feel because of those blessings. They have more responsibility to be generous. They have more responsibility to manage whatever it is that they're doing to get the blessings. It's the same way with pastors. Pastors will look at each other and they'll think they, they're blessed because they have a bigger church. Pastor Scott will tell you, mo people equals mo problems. <laughs> Don't compare. Don't compare your blessing with somebody else's, whether you look down on them for having more or you look down on yourself for not having as much. Because they've still got to drive out the Canaanites. Joshua responds and tries to give them a little motivation. He says in verse 17, it says, Then Joshua said to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph, since you are so strong and large, you will be given more than one portion. The forest of the hill country will be yours as well. Clear as much of the land as you wish and take possession of its farthest corners. You will drive out all the Canaanites from their valleys too, even though they are strong and have iron chariots. So remember, they're blessed, but they're not happy. So in order to be happy, in order to be comfortable, what they think is I have to have another blessing. We need more land. And so Joshua tells them, God's going God's to gonna do it for you, but you have to take it. But my question is, after they get the more land, after they get the next blessing, what then? Will that lead to their happiness? Well, maybe. But I think it's all in how you define blessing. You see, in the Old Testament, the way the Israelites here are, are looking at blessing, they're looking at it as to be happy, to be successful through material gain. But in the New Testament, Jesus kind of takes this idea and flips it, blends it, and changes the definition of what blessing means. Look at Matthew 5, verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon ever. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn. What? That doesn't make any sense. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Wait, hunger, thirst, filled? 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted. What? Because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So in the New Testament, when Jesus steps foot on the earth, he completely flips this definition of what blessing means. All of a sudden, because of what Jesus does and the peace and the love and the grace that Jesus allows us to access, what he does is all of a sudden the definition of being blessed no longer means being happy by material gain, but instead it is a deep field, contentment and joy because of what Jesus has done for us. It's the thing inside of us. All of a sudden, we're blessed when we have that thing inside of us that no matter what comes our way, no matter what gets blended into our lives, we can be content. That is what blessing means. So could it be maybe that you are blessed, but what if your blessing isn't what you thought? What if your blessing is getting lost in the blender? What if you're blessed, but it's blended with real life? What if you're blessed, but it isn't in what you have or what you can get, but it's in the little moments of your day? What if you've been blessed, but it's not with a bigger car, but it is in just a few little moments of your child putting their head on, their, their head on your shoulder after a long day? What if you're blessed, but it's not in a bigger house or it's not some monumental miracle, but it's the little minute moments throughout the day where you just feel at peace? What if you're blessed, but it's not with great health and everything going perfectly fine, but it's you getting to spend some time with the people that you love that you didn't expect. What if you're blessed, but it's not because circumstances are perfect, but it's because you have a deep filled contentment and joy that no matter what comes your way, no matter what life throws in your blender, you are at peace and you are at rest because your Savior marches ahead of you. What if you are blessed, but you've been defining blessing the wrong way? Jesus says, blessed are you if you mourn. It flips. Because then I can, I can get close to you and you'll get close to me and I can comfort you. Blessed are you if you're persecuted. It doesn't make sense, but Jesus says you're blessed when you're persecuted because I can do something inside of you that being completely safe on the outside could never offer. Blessed are you because you have something deeper than just the next temporary thing that's going to wear off in the next two weeks. You're blessed. The only thing between you and a blessed life is how you define blessing. The only thing. Is it going to be in what I have? Is it going to be in what I can get? Or is it going to be what's inside of me? When morning does come. When I do get the bad news. When I don't know where to turn. When I do feel all alone with everybody around me. But I feel like I'm in an empty room. Will you be blessed? Because you allow Jesus to bless you. See, we can't, we can't sift out the bad things in life so that we can just taste the blessing. But how, how, can we begin to, how can we begin to see our blessings a little better? Number one is remember where you started. Remember where you started. Some of you have come so far and it's only by the grace of God. You've come so far financially, You've come so far in your relationship with him. You've come so far from addiction. That is blessing. The grace, the mercy, the love of God is enough. You've come so far. Remember where you started. Number two, focus on the memories and not the stuff. Focus on those those little times that just seem to mean something extra special to you. Let those be the blessing. Live in the moment. 
don't always think about what I'm going to do then or what I could do if I had. Live in the moment. Live with the people that are around you. Get off your phone. Live in the moment. Find the memories. Make a memory. As Pastor Brian said several weeks ago, you don't have to spend, you don't have to spend a lot of money to make a memory. Your memory can be this afternoon when you laugh at some stupid joke that you've laughed at a million times before. Make a memory. Don't concentrate on the stuff. And number three, to find blessing God's way. To find blessing God's way. It's a deep, joy-filled contentment. When I can't see the stuff, I have the peace. When I can't grasp the thing, I have the strength. Ephesians 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So let me ask you again. Do you feel blessed? Because the banana is still in here. But I have to taste the whole thing. I have to take life, all of its problems, all of its things, and I have to taste the blessings, the inner strength, the inner contentment that Jesus wants to give us with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in the room this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's your starting place. The next thing, the next material possession is not going to solve it for you. You need a relationship with Jesus. If you've never confessed him as Lord and Savior of your life, if you could just pray this prayer silently, you can pray it out loud. We're good with that. Just say, Jesus, I've messed up. I've missed the mark. I've lost sight of, of who you are. But I believe that you are who you say you are, and I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and make me brand new. Give me that deep, blessed life. In Jesus' name, for the rest of us in the room this morning, I want you to, I want you to imagine what you're grateful for this morning. What are you grateful for? it a little different than you would have when you walked in? God, I thank you. God, I am grateful for every person under the sound of my voice. God, for their love for me, but their love for you and for their love for our community. God, I pray that we would open our eyes to see our blessings. God, that you would open our eyes to see your goodness even when it's blended with everyday life. God, help for us to taste and see that the Lord is good and to know that it's because you love us. God, thank you for the privilege of teaching your word. Thank you that it never returns void, void and it always does its work. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.